Hi, and welcome to another Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's episode, I meet a painter who lives out in New York who does uh, different types of abstract work. We talk about how the artist got into being an abstract art artist. Uh, they originally started out doing realistic type things. Uh, one of the influences they named was Norman Rockwell, and they'd been to school in different places. They'd lived in different places. That's in the beginning. It starts out, they're in New York, but they lived here, here, and here, and in another country. <laughs> There's a weird chain of events that lead to all different places all over the world. Um, they also have a show that's coming out. Actually, at the time that this podcast is coming out, the show should be a gallery show in New York should be happening right now. So uh, we'll get into more of this and uh, their work and what they do right now uh, on the podcast. Here it goes. I'm Peter Shank. Uh, I'm a painter primarily, but I also do a lot of curatorial projects, uh, kind of with any not any particular regularity I do when I kind of jump into them, but yeah, painter and sometimes curator. Okay. And where are you located right now? Uh, right now I'm in Brooklyn, New York, specifically Crown Heights, okay. New York. Uh, and that's a little bit for listeners out there. That's basically east of, uh, well, I guess if you know Brooklyn, it's basically, yeah, I don't know Brooklyn any of Museum. it. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, it's sort of, you could call it like central Brooklyn in a way it's, um, and it's, if you were say if you were in Manhattan, I guess it's, that's for New Yorkers too. It's like, uh, <laughs> I know the names. <laughs> yeah. You can edit all this out, but it's essentially, it's essentially central Brooklyn, I okay. guess you could say. Yeah. Um, uh, and I, most of my, I also do freelance art handling. I primarily work, uh, part-time and work in the city. Uh, but my projects, art related, whether showing my own work or curating others is both Brooklyn and Manhattan. But my live workspace, my apartment and my studio are both located in Brooklyn. I've been there once and and I was there at night and then we left like it was the same night. So I didn't get to see anything. I don't even remember the club that we went to 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 go play. But oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, I, I like it a lot. I mean, I, I didn't live here growing up. I was actually born in, uh, in New York City. Um, and both my, both my parents are from Brooklyn, funny enough, and a lot of my family pretty far back. But I grew up in different parts of the world. I grew up uh, a little bit in Asia and then uh, southern U.S. I grew up in Atlanta, funny enough. Okay. Um, why, then- why such a vast change in the different places that you live yeah, uh, it's a good question my dad although he was in vietnam years back it wasn't like an army brat thing my i think it was mostly for my dad's work he were he's a very different profession than mine he was a banker for most of his life and okay he worked for uh a bank that basically located him and he was up for the travel experience and with his family and that's just where they happened to land and when they were like oh well we'll put you in tokyo if you like that, and he's like, let's do it. And then they're okay. like, I'd probably uh, answer the same way. Yeah. I, I think I would if I, maybe as adventurous, maybe not. Um, and then, so I, I lived in Tokyo the first year after I was born in Manhattan. Um, and then I lived another four years until I was five in Hong Kong. Hmm. Uh, and I remember the tail end of that. I was five when we left. So uh, kind of funny. We went back when I was in my, when I was 10 but yeah, I remember the tail end of that, but most of my growing up and what I remember coming online is uh, growing up in just like the suburbs of Atlanta, like nothing that specific. It was just like suburbia. Okay. Um, and, you know, the South, it's, you know, like the suburbs, Georgia it was fine to grow up in. The first chance I got, I wanted to go North. So um, I... When I got into Boston University for grad undergrad, rather, yeah, that that was my first move north. Okay, and long answer. And then finally, in different, uh, I'll just give you that. Like I did, uh, so I went to school there. Spent another year um, after that preparing for grad school, and then I moved to Philadelphia, uh, clustering around. My my idea was always to get closer and closer to New York. Yeah, but. But going to these other schools, and then I went to grad school in Philly, um, stuck around for a few more years, and then moved, fast forward, moved to Brooklyn about 10 years ago. 
Okay. Um, so I've been here since then. <laughs> so during that yeah. time period, when did you actually start uh, painting and doing the stuff that you're doing right now? Uh, it's a good question. I I mean, I've, I've been drawing. I mean, going back, I've been drawing ever since I was a kid. And most kids start out making art. But I drawing was a big thing for me. And I stuck with it uh, in kind of those years when a lot of people maybe stopped making art or around like their, you know, 10, 11, 12. I kind of dug in more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Painting came later. A drawing was like really big deal for me. I just like really got well, into it. Well, and it's it. the I, easiest to achieve because all you totally. need is a pencil yeah, and paper. You don't, you don't need a big studio. You don't, you know, yeah. a pencil and a piece of paper and you're good to go. And, but I, and it's something I liked and kind of in a funny way when you're figuring out what you're kind of good at as a kid, I, you know, I got a little bit of attention for it. Um, I liked that. I also just enjoyed doing it. I would sell like even drawings for, a dollar or something in, in uh, elementary school. And I stuff. wish I would have thought of that. I used to draw yeah. pictures for people yeah. all the time in, in grade school. Oh, yeah. And it's like, why did I never charge for that? I could have been buying yeah, myself yeah. whatchamacallit bars and everything, you know? Uh, totally, <laughs> man. Yeah, yeah. You could have started right at the beginning. I also, it was funny too, and although I do less prints now, I would make copies on like a old Xerox machine of drawings and also sell those and stuff. But like, you know. Okay. Um, and I wouldn't say it was a huge business, but yeah, I, I had like a, uh, there was a nice, whatever feedback that people liked what I was doing. And basically at that time, it was a lot of like observate, like drawings. I, I mean, I still do, but I really liked back then someone like Norman Rockwell, someone that's like, Oh, yeah. really drawing the figure. And it's something I could understand. And like now I like all of it, but get like understanding abstraction or enjoying that came a lot later but like back to your question, yeah, the drawing and like really kind of took hold maybe in my adolescence and I just kept at it. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to even like at a public high school to have a really good art teacher and art program that kind of fostered that. And then around high school started painting a bit more on like sort like semi-serious level and building a little bit of a, starting to build a portfolio for college. But uh that I, I had a lot of good people on the way, and particularly high school teachers and middle school teachers that were like, oh, you should keep doing this kind of thing. Well, and let's go yeah. into when the yeah. the transition to uh, abstract kind of happened. What yeah. would you, how, how did that come about? What was the first thing that made you go, oh, I really like this, you know, when it started? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a good question. It, it was like, I would say it was like one or two things right around when I was in the middle of my undergrad time in Boston. Um, I had a really great teacher. I th he might still be teaching in Boston. His name is uh, Richard Raisless. And it's just a name I'll put out. Maybe some artists might know he is. He's a really fantastic landscape and portrait painter. And funny enough, a lot of my school at BU, Boston U, was very heavy on observation. Mm -hmm. But as you got into your upper tier kind of courses or your junior and senior year, there were other professors that were like, you know, or him in particular, but other professors were like, Maybe you should look at, you know, mix in with your observation, like look at de Kooning or look at the structure of uh, Willem de Kooning painting or someone that um, for like the artists out there, it's like someone that both straddled uh, figuration and abstraction with someone like Philip Gustin. And it didn't, it, some of, some of it just clicked for me with a lot of those abstract New York artists of the fifties that I've started looking at in my junior year. So say it was like 19, 20 Mm -hmm. And and to be honest, for for years leading up to that, I kind of didn't get it. I thought it was like, uh, you know, kind of emperor's like clothes kind of thing. Yeah. I was like, come on. I just really, honestly, it wasn't for me. I was like, what am I looking at? And I would say the other thing that opened up for me because of the narrative of it, I read this big biography that came out in 2004, 2005 on Willem de Kooning, another big ad abstraction guy from the 50s yeah and somehow the narrative of that a bit of the romance of new york and just like the writing was so good about the nuts and bolts and realizing that a light went on that it's not easy to make maybe a good abstract painting and i had right i had thought very opposite which is also like yeah it's just have my thinking obviously you know making anything is difficult but it finally clicked of like oh i can find something in in this and then finally like really dug in really hard and you know it then kind of switched gears on what kind of work I wanted to make. But yeah. Okay. And then what would you yeah. say it, from that? What would you say the description of what you make is? I mean, if you were to 
Uh, you know, there's always the one category yeah. that you have to pick where we're saying abstract, but there's right. always subcategories. So what would you yeah. say, like, how would you describe your work? Uh, it's a good question. I, and I've been doing it long enough. I'm trying to get better at like the elevator pitch, so to speak. Yeah. Even though with everything I said with abstraction, and then I'll try to hone it down. I, I actually, in a funny way, classify myself as almost like a modernist. Uh, figurative artist with abstract impulses okay in a way so a lot of my art uh, as i see it there's there's a figure of some kind in all of it um but it's almost like it's almost figurative uh pop in a way i could put it like that way because i yeah. i i work with the figure so much or there's like this is a pbr painting I was uh, noticing I that. I was I was trying to figure out when that was in the background. I was like, is that is that a PBR logo? <laughs> yeah. So it's, okay. it's actually a painting I did uh, almost actually a year after grad school in Philly because uh, I was in this uh, really strong group show that I was psyched about. So I made this painting. I painted that in 2011. But even though I bounced around, it's still pretty emblematic of what I do. I um, Even though I – like abstract art, it taught me and like even looking at pop art – to be interested in like flattening material. Mm -hmm. I, I, I knew I could draw, you know, paint the shadow or like the side of the hand and make it look like the hands turning. But all of a sudden it was in me to kind of flatten things. And then occasionally not so much in that painting, but other paintings have a little bit of both scenario. Like I might have that flat image with a drop shadow, but going back to what I would like, the umbrella of my work would be like, uh, it's figurative, it's pop. There's abstract flatness coming in, but figuration is still in there. It's certainly not what would you call um, old school observation. It's what I studied, but then mm -hmm. I I emptied some of that out of it in favor of like a, cer a definitely a certain level of cartoon, uh, almost diorama like science project y like there's a figure, maybe there's a funny drop shadow somewhere. I make these like interiors and you use uh, very time. thick outlines on some of the characters that I've seen too. And I dig that. Yeah. I like that yeah. a lot. Yeah. I, I, you know, and I, it, it was definitely one of those things like being in art school, like when you're told not to do something, it's either, well, it's, you go one of two ways. You don't do it or you like dig it harder and you make it seem like it matters more. So I, right. I went into those realms of like, I'm sure plenty of teachers were like, you shouldn't be outlining your work kind of thing or yeah. even if it is like this. And I was like, all right, whatever, I'll just go this realm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but uh, yeah, no, okay. very observant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what, yeah. so what is the process when you start a project? And I know you do both like large and small projects. I've seen some of your yeah. stuff in the wild and your yeah. big ones can get very big. And, you know, yeah. what are what are some of the processes for creating these and how do you know where, what you want to start with? Yeah, uh, it, it's a good question. It changes a lot, to be honest. I wish I had almost like a, I, I, I'm definitely not, a, I, I'm almost envious of some artists that's like, they either start a small painting or a big painting. Yeah. They focus on that. It's all they do for maybe two months or three months. And I actually, a lot year. of people I talk to, that's not how it goes to tell you the I truth. Think, they'll, yeah, I think they'll do like, multiple ones, but it's, it's totally. easy to assume that because it yeah. seems like it's so much work, but yeah, working on several projects at once actually seems to be the norm. I've run into that a lot. Yeah, no, totally. I think that's what I had in my head when I thought of like the big artists or what they do, but yeah, Absolutely. I mean, most of the community of artists that I know, I mean, <clears throat> I bounce around a lot. I might have, uh, and in my studio, there might be what, like a big painting size for me, which is either like 60 by 60 inches between five by five feet by five. Sometimes I go larger mm -hmm. in grad school. When I had like more space, I made a 14 foot painting and like, and I am still down to do that another day. Um, and I'll still go as large as maybe like a five by six. Um, but I, yeah, I bounce around a lot. I might work on even a painting of that size, like say a five by five or a six by six. I might like go in kind of guns blazing and like work on it for really intensely from like a charcoal drawing to really, or like a painting underpainting to like 90 or 70% of the drawing painting. Sorry. I might like, follow through in say three three weeks to a month or less on okay. a paper painting and i block that in then i might shelve it and i might work on uh even while i'm doing that two or three like two by two foot paintings or something uh 
and and then I might bring that painting out periodically over the course of six months, mm -hmm. and and then it's like alive in my studio wall, and then I attack it so to speak for a couple of weeks. Um, but to get back to like a cumulative like answer, a big painting could like I did one big painting called Ram Skull. You can find it in my Instagram feed. It's, yeah, uh, maybe like a year back. That was one of the bigger sizes I've done in a couple of years, and that was around six by five feet. That I would say I knocked out, um, majority of it I knocked out in about three, four months, and then I returned to it <clears throat> seven months later, and I just made some hits in about two weeks, and it was done. Okay. Um, and then to like wrap it up too, like because of the pandemic, I revisited a couple paintings I had started right in early 2020, and I took my time and kind of actually – like sometimes it's the nature of a show. Like there's a there's a Scottish painter I like a lot. He's uh, sells his work very well, millions of dollars, whatever. But I his imagery is amazing. Must be it's, nice. It's pretty good. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to get there someday. I sell work uh, with you know some regularity, but not like that. But his name is Peter Doig, and he had it's a very like painter's painter's answer. He's like a painting is finished when it has to leave the studio, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, I don't. I prescribe to that somewhat. I'll, I like to even do a big painting, finish it within six to eight months while working on other projects. Um, one painting I did revisit uh, three years after I made it, and I didn't really. Oh, really? Re yeah. So I'm. Th this answer is like you know a novel, basically. Well, I mean, I, you've I, you've made more than one painting. There's more than one answer. There's no, <laughs> there's oh, no yeah, wrong yeah, answer. Yeah, no, no, totally. <laughs> I, yeah, and I. And I uh, totally true. I, I changed it up a lot. I mean, I did a painting actually four years ago. And then last summer I was like, the imagery is going to stay the same, but mm -hmm. I want to give it a much, not necessarily certain edges were sharper, but I wanted to make a much more like, like really make it pop the surface. And it wasn't just there for me yet. So, so you're saying yeah. like paintings yeah. that you've actually like years later, they've already been out in the wild. You've already hung them places. Then you go look yeah. at them and go, you know what? Yeah. I can do that better. And you just yeah, do totally. instead of like making a new one and going, here's a new version of it in the way I would have done it. You yeah. apply it directly to the one that you had that's already been out there, which there's nothing wrong with yeah. that. That's oh, kind yeah, of interesting, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah, it's it's a little and I, I take it almost in a good way. Like it's a good level of crazy. And I'll also there's certain paintings. Uh, there's definitely certain ones. And even that was an anomaly. But I will do that from time to time. Mm -hmm. A lot after a certain like period, I'm like, I do kind of put. A check mark off. I I put it away. It's you know, it's like an, an another artist answer of like I think if I do anything more to it, I'm going to detract from it. It's solid, mm -hmm. but every now and then there's that anomaly of like ah, I'm going to redo the surface. And, yeah, and what does it matter? Fair. I mean, yeah, it's yeah, your yeah. stuff. You can do what you want with it. It's not like somebody's uh, totally. coming in and going, hey, could you? You know, it's right. different if somebody would be like, you know, this would be better if that color there was pink. You know, or or something. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you'd be no, offended. Totally. Then you'd be like, "No, it's perfect." <laughs> right, right. It's definitely. I mean, like you said, it's like, yeah, it's it's your work. It's one of the few areas in life you're like, ah, uh, yeah, I'm gonna redo this whole thing, or yeah. I'm gonna change that pink or that green, or yeah, whatever. okay. Um, yeah. Now, when you're making these too, is there a plan for it already going out the door? Are you usually making these for gallery spots or are you making them and then searching for places to put them or sell them? Like what's what what happens after yeah. you get done with these? It's, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I'll, I'll start off the answer where it's like, I would say it's 50-50. Sometime I have an idea of like, I'm making a triptych. I'm doing three paintings that are 20 by 20 inches because okay. that's what I want to do. Um you know, maybe half the time I, you know, I'm lucky enough to have a project, meaning a show or something coming up. Yeah. And that's going to, that's going to definitely inform some decisions. I was lucky enough to have a show uh, a couple years back at this gallery of freight and volume in New York. It's got a, kind of a funny name, and it, but it's a uh, base downtown, really strong painters gallery. That was a situation where the owner was like, yeah, it's, it was a fairly big size gallery. And he's like, if you want, we'd like you to go, pretty crazy. And if you want to make an eight or nine foot painting, you could make three or four of those and they would look great in the back of this room. Mm -hmm. And I did it. And it was, you know, it looked great. So sometimes I probably wouldn't have that follow through on my own unless someone was like, we've got a space waiting for it. <laughs> we'll show it. Okay. Um, but then other times it's like, uh, you know, the other side of the coin is like, oh, I feel like making this size painting. And then, but like, I usually have groups of like a body of work in mind in sort of chunks 
like not necessarily the size, but like a theme um, in a certain thing. I will say like I had a show that I did with this gallery in Brooklyn uh, just about a year ago. Um, the name of the gallery is Park Place Gallery, and they're located in Brooklyn. And I thought up this idea. If you've heard of the term Vanitas, it's I think uh, so. it's like an old. It's a, it's a. I liked it because it's almost like a dusty old, uh, basically subject matter from like Dutch and Germanic still life painting from the 1700s. See, to me, it so, just sounds like somebody mispronouncing yeah. the word gravitas. Basically, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that guy has a lot of Vanitas. Yeah. You can say that. But, yeah. Uh, no, totally. It's it's a weird name, and I liked it for that reason. Yeah. And like so, answering the question, like not necessarily size, but I brought that into it. I was like, oh, I'm gonna make in a very cartoony pop, like 21st century language. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be this funny, like old name that is associated with like Rembrandt paintings or other things like that. But I am working with the still life. Vanitas is also a connection with. Not to be too dark on a Friday. It's it's the temporality of life and like these bigger issues of you have a skull and you have a candle that's like burning out and. Uh -huh. But when, when I did it in my work, it was like a half empty uh, PBR paint or PBR beer or like a cartoon skull that has a leaf growing out of it. So thematically, I was able to lock down these ten or fifteen paintings that I'm going to group around this subject matter. Okay. And that and that's like oh a project oriented theme. Kind of thing. All right. And yeah. now when you get these gallery shows, actually, when you started trying to put yeah. your stuff in galleries, how did you go about finding places to connect with, places where you could put your stuff? Uh, what was yeah. the method, like, as a person who was starting out when you were starting out? Sure. Um, it's a very good question. I wish I had heard the answer more when I was in school because it's everyone's on a different journey. It's a very funny and strange puzzle piece how people do it or I guess how I do it. But yeah. Um, the way I approached it, I mean, I started showing a bit after grad school when I was in Philly and when I was still living in Philly, a lot of it, some of it came through like kind of doggedly looking online, applying for things. Um, there's different sites like that, that have opportunities that you can apply. And those are juried shows. Those are great, but that's, you know, you put your app in, you give $20 right. of your money away and maybe you never, hear from them again, yeah. maybe you do. That That is a path to start showing. I did some of that. Um, the other part I did, and it's also, it's like the oldest school way, is like um, a lot of artists have said, it's like you kind of find your community of artists, mm -hmm. and it's a lot of hanging out at shows. And like it for me, it was like a lot of artists I went to undergrad and graduate school that I found a community of those artists that were still like making work after grad school, and in New York, and a lot of it in a funny way is like hanging out, going to shows, picking up kind of like, uh, oh, maybe if you introduce yourself to this gallerist, they're interested in fun, strange, figurative art. Okay. And that could still be like months, but maybe then in the back of their mind, they're like, oh, I met Peter Shank and he, you know, said uh, maybe I'd be the right fit for this. Now, that's kind of like your cold calling scenario in terms of like, going up to a gallerist that works and doesn't work. And it's, it's mm -hmm. a strange puzzle piece. W what I started doing and, you know, I call myself a bit of a curator. I also call myself like a, almost like an art organizer in a funny way, being a painter first. I started doing these like fun um, art shows out of my studios oh, uh, okay. particularly in Brooklyn. So that's basically that's how, when I moved here, I moved here very like early 2013 and I kind of – I had friends that were doing this. It was like kind of hip, kind of cool. It was like they were art parties that were also like very sharp art shows inside people's apartments, inside people's studios. And it was funny. I just like – I kind of took that mantle of people just putting on, you know, still really like sharp, well-conceived shows. Not that they have to be terribly fancy, meaning like they're installed well on a wall, even if it's in a living room or someone picked five strong, fun artists threw a theme on it and, you know, you put it online and you just BYOB or whatever. And, you know, however you want to invite it, yeah. but you build a community that way and people see your work. And I started doing that particularly, I, I threw a name on a show and just called it studio jams. Like, cause jams would just be like a very fun way to be like, Oh, here's a new painting. Here's a new jam I made. Okay. And I was like, Oh, studio jams also sounds like a mixtape. It sounds something very accessible and I just put that title onto it 
and then my studio, my first, I've, I've moved studios a lot, but my studio for other people that New York, no Brooklyn, whatever, I had a studio in Gowanus where they actually, uh, it probably used to be like a mafia run place back in the 1980s and nineties. But anyways, it is a very like, <laughs> it's a very hip now right. industrial like studio art place. That's a side note, but anyways, okay. but that's another tangent. But basically I just decided like, I'm going to put on these fun art shows Maybe they're only up for a weekend, and it's really just about the opening. But I had the idea that people will see them. It'll be a fun show. But, you know, and then I just, like, th would throw my work into those shows, too, but find really strong artists, friends that were making art. And and in a funny way, getting more to, like, I made the leap from doing those shows, and I still do those shows, but I made the leap where a friend of a friend saw, like, my second or shirt, third show just doing this in the studio. Okay. And he was like – it was kind of the thing you want to happen. I didn't expect it to happen uh, terribly fast, but a couple shows in, a couple months in, a buddy or a friend of a friend was like, I'll put you in the room with a pretty good gallerist, not a huge gallery, but a very commendable gallery that was in the Lower East Side at the time. Yeah. And he's like, if you can think of another theme, you want, you seems like you know how to throw on a, a, a strong show if you're going to make it look good in your studio. I'll get you in a room because he was a represented artist at this gallery. So that's kind of like the community word of mouth thing. Okay. And that, that was a way for me to circumvent just like blindly selling, you know, my $40 and my 10 images in. You just, you kind of make a little nook and you maybe try to create that as a center. Okay. You know? How long of a process would you say that took? Uh, well, and it's still like, it's off like that. I mean, not, not I that it's perfected. Of course, it's always growing. Right. But, you right, know, right. when you got the, the end result that you had there that you just described, like over yeah. a, what period of time would you say that was? That was pretty fast. So let's say, so I moved, well, I'll even just, because it was all fairly even tight to me. Well, okay, I moved here in 2013. Let's say I started curating and doing these fun uh, one night, one week only shows in my studio in uh, winter of 2014. Okay. Um, and then fast forward a little bit. This show in particular that I was talking about when I had this, stu this studio in Brooklyn, this friend of a friend, that was, uh, I did a show in February of 2015 and he saw it and I, and then I had a, I had a full on meeting by the summer of 2015. So these things aren't right away, but it was okay. relatively moving along. That's still pretty good. I mean, over a period of a year. Yeah. Yeah. And then within, let's say, and then within February of 2016, I had this pretty massive 15 person show in a really uh, credible, like large gallery uh, in the heart of downtown New York okay. within a year of that one show to being in a real gallery show. All right. Um, nice. And I would say too, and like, not like uh, other shows happened out of, um, you know, being my, my day to day, even though, yeah, I sell work more and more. I do a little bit less of that work, but I still freelance art handle I art handle, it's not always at galleries I want to show it, but sometimes I will certainly look at a gallery that if there was an opening without being too pushy, I'm like, I could see myself this gallery. Okay. I'll work here because it's a job. But at a few places, both the gallery that I was represented by for five years called Freight and Volume and a handful of other galleries, I worked there. And then there was an opening when an artist fell through. The owner of that gallery knew my work was ready to go. Yeah. And I got my... And around that same time, say this group show that I did, um, uh, which was the one that was like kind of a big deal at the time, that name was, uh, that show was Young Frankensteins. It was my hmm. take on the funny figuration. Um, but within that short amount of time, that was winter 2016, I was working as just a worker bee, art handler, gallery manager at this gallery also downtown. And right around that same time, summer of 2016, an artist pulled out and I got my first solo show in New York okay. um, on the Upper East Side simply because I had sort of, without being medium level pushy, had, <laughs> let the had let the gallerist know, I think I'm a good fit here. If you ever have a gap in your schedule, my work is ready to go, basically. Okay. And I kind of was like a little bit pushy, but also like, you know, you need to be the I mean, right you got to be a little bit, you know. It's... You got to, you have to, you got to put it out there and then like, Lay back, put it out right. there, and that's how, yeah. You don't got to be Joe Pesci about it, but, you know, you got to be a little pushy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you need to take a bat out, I'm actually rewatching a lot of Sopranos. You know, you got to do what you Oh, are you? Different. Yeah. 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 <laughs> nice. About every year and a half, two years, I almost, like, I'll watch one episode, and then I'll rewatch. It's just, yeah, it's like, yeah, there's a lot of content out there. <laughs> that's but awesome. Sometimes you need to be a little bit Tony Soprano, or, yeah, if you're going to, like, right. make things happen, and then you got to be, you know. 
the nice side of things. Yeah. Now, uh, you actually, at the time of recording this, you have a gallery show starting tomorrow, I believe. Tell me a little bit Correct. about that gallery show. Yeah, this is like really good timing, and I can do a solid plug for the show. Um, it's it's got a really great title. The name of it is Terrible Fathers, so it's a bit right. It's a which it, I'm surprised been, you didn't do around Father's Day, but okay, carry on. I, that's true, and actually, and actually. <laughs> He's not a terrible father. My father is going to see the show this weekend, and he's up with my mom for my mom's high school reunion here in Brooklyn. Oh, but, uh, nice. But the the uh, the origin of it was I commissioned – he was an artist, a uh, friend of mine. We went to grad school together. Uh, he's a really great painter. His name is Daniel Gerwin. And in a nutshell, I commissioned him to do a essay on my work for a show a couple of years ago. And in it, he phrased that I was battling – these terrible fathers. And it was like a great line. It was like, Peter is, you know, however much I'm at that level, but I was wrestling with like the Picasso influence and the okay. Leger influence or Philip Gustin, any number of these kind of big painting heavyweights. And so that was just like this great essay, but laying dormant for a couple of years. Then I, sometimes I do projects on my own. Sometimes I team up with other artists that I think will be a good fit curatorially to do a project and I was doing studio visits with a, a buddy of mine now, a great painter in his own right. Uh, his name is Dominic uh, Terlizzi, my co-curator on this project. And the early part of this year, we just kept throwing around this term. I was like, oh, I'm thinking about my terrible fathers again. He's like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> and we just started talking about like influences that, that artists uh, have internally, but also you know influences that as an art viewer, I might look at an artist and be like, oh, they're terrible father might be Picasso or might be Jackson Pollock or something like that. Yeah. And in a nutshell too, like terrible, terrible can be taken a lot of ways. We want to have fun with the title. We're also serious. We're, it's a little bit of serious, a little bit of fun. Terrible could be, you know, Picasso Pollock, you know, you put those guys in the 21st century guys. Uh, they, they, they're problematic figures in, yes. in, in different ways. Socially. Yes. All I've, stuff. I've seen both the movies about them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you've seen Ed Harris's movie, yeah, Jack right. Pollock was when he wasn't relatively sober making his work, he was insane. Um, yeah, and he was terrible in a lot of ways to people. All that and a terrible so driver, could, and and a very <laughs> you could put it up there as one of the worst drivers ever, uh, killing a young woman and all jokes. That's yes, thing. So these are yeah, these are problematic figures. Terrible can also mean just the weight of influence as a young or mid career artist what that influence has on you and how you're reacting to that. So that's the content of it. And basically I wanted to group along with Dominic 10 artists that we think are grappling that in like a spirited, like, you know, truly wrestling with those ideas. And these are big heavyweight figures and, and making their own language in spite of that heavy influence and because of it, in spite of it and just how they're dealing with it, whether it's like more clinical abstraction, like a Mondrian painting or the rough and tumble of like a Picasso painting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I also like, I like mixing up the venues. I, I very much like when I can certainly showing in a very, what you would think of as like a New York gallery or what have you. That's like the street front gallery with the glass and it's the big white walls. I also like going back to the roots of like a studio oriented show party and sometimes things align. A buddy of mine it was a, was willing to show uh, and give up a good chunk of his space, which is going to be this open studios environment in the Lower East Side. And he was like, I think so your show could do very well in part of my studio. So that vibe fit very well, I think. Or, and almost negating and having fun. Like this show is almost a show that my own ambition and confidence is like in a serial format. I'd like to see the show in a museum or a large gallery, like volume three, terrible fathers. I'd like to see it a big gallery. Okay. But I like that this origin of it is like in this quirky space in the lower East side. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, that's kind of the spirit of the show, but yeah, it does. It opens tomorrow night. Um, and this, this podcast will come after it, but right. it's a fast show. It'll basically be up for two weekends. You know, a, a, you know, you're kind of normal, what have you, uh, art shows maybe up for a month or six weeks. I like, right. I play around with that idea. I also do with what works. Uh, this is oriented for just a faster show and it changes all the time, but yeah, that show's coming up. So. Okay. Uh, but it's exciting. We're actually, 
we we placed the show last night, me and my fellow curator, meaning that's like the Christmas aspect of it where you unwrap everything, yeah. you know, and it's almost like you've done the work of like logistically, you know, I love artists, but you are like herding cats in a way to get all the work. Oh yeah. And you know, it's a, you know, if you're going to a bar just to get two people to yeah, different personalities, right different yeah things yeah. that are going on in their lives. You're only Absolutely. connected because of one particular venue you're going to be at. Yeah, that's totally. It's and, not. And it's everyone, not like living with someone. <laughs> no, absolutely. And everyone we pick are like great artists that are also like, you know, they're the majority of them are artists that all have day jobs, myself included. But they're all, you know, they're professional in their demeanor and how they're making work and all that. Said so it's like I, all I've done shows with a like a, a vast amount of different artists i've i've enjoyed like bringing in my professor from my grad program in the same show with someone that's you know basically my contemporary next to the 60 year old professor that's also making great work um this but this you know this is more of like my community of artists roughly the same age kind of roughly at the same part in our career um a lot of people that i mean in a very good way are hustling getting shows but yeah, they're not at the uh, they're not at the million dollar sales level yet, but people are showing and they care about their work and they've got a great body of work. So yeah. That's, and uh, yeah. another thing, too, is you do show a lot of your stuff. Uh, you have a website and you have a lot of yeah. your stuff on there. Do you ever sell any of your stuff online? Do you ever post things for sale online and, yeah. you know, to people outside of just the, the yeah. gallery community that you're at? Uh, it's a good question. And I the, the answer is yes, I I. I will sell when I have like a, you know, a show like this, you know, there's a checklist, the works are for sale okay. in the show we're doing. I'll, I will sell my work through a gallery where that's, you know, the more professional side of things is they're going to take a 40 or 50% cut. Okay. You're going to get, they're going to get their commission, but you know, they're showing your work. I, the pandemic, in spite of all of the horribleness and what that, everything that event is, and we're still in the thick of it, 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 a lot of artists of my level, I, I was able to sell a good amount of work online, actually. Okay. Um, and through these it, galleries, you're saying? Through the galleries, but actually also through like, uh, not all, sometimes galleries, sometimes like artists in my community would do like an online show on Instagram. Okay. Or, and so, and maybe the percentage was lower because they're like, we want to give money more back to the artists. They want to make something as I would as a curator, but maybe that percentage isn't going to be 50%. They might be like, I, I joined forces. I found, uh, um, we worked together a bit. I found a dealer online on Instagram and I, I actually said like, this is in the thick of the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. I was like, would you like to do an online show together and see what we could move? And, and he was like, yeah, let's do it. So we actually, you know, the show wasn't in a brick and mortar space that wasn't happening at the time. Mm -hmm. And we were able to sell a few works and find collectors and, and every, situation is different sometimes say for an online dealer um because you know they're not showing you in the brick and mortar space i think it's very fair but maybe they'll take 30 percent as opposed to 50 percent. but every situation is a little bit different but i was fortunate enough that not necessarily a six foot painting but i was fortunate enough to sell like uh a 20 by 16 like paintings on paper or drawings stuff like a little bit smaller like that that could mail easily okay um, do you ship it out or are they shipping it out for you every every situation is different okay. um when i when i work with a gallery like say if i work with a you know if i'm saying a gallery gallery a gallery that maybe has like a full staff it's open six days a week uh -huh. and, and if you're represented by a gallery, which i have been uh now i'm working in a, in a freer sense with a handful of art advisories it's basically like an interesting mesh. I've, I work with, I still work with a couple of art advisors and that means basically maybe one person, maybe three people that have their own floating advisory. There's not necessarily a brick and mortar space and their, their um, expertise to their collectors is selling drawings. They don't do the other stuff, but with them it's like, okay, we'll work out. You get 40%. Uh, but because these are small works, I'll take care of the shipping. I mean, or I'll pack it, and then you're all, but you're paying me for the shipping. Okay. Say if it's a five foot painting and it's through a gallery, I'm going to put it on them to, if right. they're taking a large. That's why I asked. Large, I was just right. like, you know, that's right. Uh, I've had to, I've had to ship things large like that before. And I'm like, this is oh, going to yeah. take me all day. <laughs> totally. If, if a gallery is taking 40 or 
and they have what would be like called like a consignment of your work instead of a freer like maybe an online thing is like oh they've got two paintings we'll see what happens these are drawings that can literally be mailed uh, and if it's you know mailed safely with cardboard, can be mailed very cheap. Yeah, a five foot painting that maybe needs like a travel crate or even a very well made box. Right. I'm gonna maybe put that on a gallery if they're taking fifty yeah, percent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it it fluctuates. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. And then yeah. I just had uh, one more thing I wanted to ask. Yeah. So coming up in the future, I mean, I know you have this gallery here, but are there any future yeah. works or plans or projects that you're working on that, uh, that people should know about that they should be keeping an eye out for? Um, all uh, the short answers. I, I don't have some like a specific name of projects, but what I will say is I've got, I've got like a two person show with it's, this is very kind of <laughs> cloak and dagger, but yeah. I have a, I basically have an iron into the fire of a show I'm working on and just like writing it out, meaning I'm writing out my own synopsis of it, of a show that could work very well that me and another strong artist is included in. Okay. Um, because I don't have any sign off, but I have a few galleries of mine. I'm basically in a pitching scenario of possibly a two person show that I, I would say, um a few of like the uh like i'm basically toying around with this show that might even be called facetime or totems or structures very different in ways but okay. me and this other artist that have these almost very structural facial kind of paintings that i'm now just kind of constructing in the very early phase of a two-person show that maybe we'll see the light of the day in new york Maybe in the fall, maybe next year. But that's the next okay. Project. That was good. that was what I was wondering. Is like, yeah, is, yeah. is this coming soon? Because it sounds in the early stages. But then I remembered you also said that you work kind of fast. So, <laughs> well, that's the one thing, I, and I would say to any artist too, and it's something that I had to learn. It's like, I, I think it's good to have projects in your back pocket. Have oh, them yeah. kind of like, I mean, as you know, as a musician, and like, uh, like that was the thing that I learned being around people that not you know that are people that are like kind of making a few moves or showing this and that the the opportunities that i had when i show to continue to show in galleries it's it was that kind of soprano-esque banantala like i got work ready uh here's a project and here's like a, a three paragraphs on it or here's my elevator pitch of i think what could work well and people you know you're having a beer you're talking about with someone that's the gallery and they're like okay yeah and then two months later maybe maybe three months they're like i think i could use that show uh -huh. or that that is kind of how things work sometimes for me. Um, so yeah. Okay. But having a project kind of on the back burner, semi ready to go, and then and then other times it is like um, a gallerist might be like, yeah, could you craft something for me? That's a nice thing. Right. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Okay. But right now, yeah, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you yeah. so much for coming on the show okay. and talking with me today. Thanks a lot, Ty. I really appreciate it.